Welcome back to the Hard Parking Podcast presented by the NSX channel on Instagram, your number one source of NSX content. I am Jay Finning. I am your host. If this is your first time to the show, I do the show a little different. Thank you for taking the chance on the show. You see automotive. A lot of people see automotive. They're afraid. They don't want to listen to a bunch of car talk because cars are boring unless you're really into them. This is the non-automotive automotive podcast. Coming up in a little bit, we're going to do the Q&A segment that everybody seems to really enjoy. So the Q&A segment works like this. On Instagram, typically, I'll put a post up and I'll say, submit your questions. If I pick your question, usually I'll end up giving you something in return for your time and your effort. Hopefully, the people who submit questions actually listen to the show. However, it is not a requirement. You're really going to want to listen to the Builder's Corner segment. I have a guest on who is a well-known person in the NSX community. If you're aspiring to buy an NSX, because a lot of you are, you're not going to want to miss that part of the interview. But then again, why would you miss it? Because it's later on during the show. Want to get into some automotive news to kind of sublet. I don't have a rental car of the week. I may talk about one that I had a long time ago, but I don't have a dedicated rental car of the week. So instead, I'm going to replace that with some automotive news. Have a call out to a guest to talk about some other stuff. I don't want to spoil it. What I want to talk about to open up this podcast, 2020 has been really tough on a lot of people. Two weeks ago, the area lost a couple members. They were depressed. They were going through some things and they took their own lives. One a lot of people know about. One I don't think very many people know about. One guy was 22. He had his own company, had everything going for him, but one of my friends was really close to that situation. A lot of people in the area are close to that situation. This individual, I know I've talked to him a couple times. I remember seeing his car at pretty much every event. Seemed like the guy that everybody liked. I spent some time talking to a good friend of mine that night that was really, really close to the situation. He said there weren't any signs, and there probably isn't a sign. But one thing you have to remember, a lot of you have to remember that when it comes to hobby, a lot of times, hobby is people's escape, no matter what your hobby is. It's your escape from the reality. It's your escape from your family sometimes. It's your escape from work pressures. In the last episode, I talked about one of the car trips that, that I took to San Diego. And one of my friends that came with me, I haven't talked to him in a long time. And I called him two days before and I said, hey, do you want to go to California? He said, yes. He jumped in his car. He said he really needed it. And he's one of those people who detached from reality. So he drops off the map. And I always worry about him because he lives by himself outside of town. And sometimes he just drops off the radar. And after the trip, he said, thank you so much for inviting me. I really needed that. I hate my job. I really needed that time off. And so you never really know what people are going through. And if you see somebody at work and they're a friend of yours or they're just an acquaintance and you've had conversation with them, they just seem a little off you know, check in with them. And sometimes we don't want to tell people if something's going on. So it's like, hey, man, you good? You seem a little different. You seem a little off. Oh, man, I'm good. Just got some stuff going on. I'm good. I'm fine. Well, you know you've reached out. But sometimes people are afraid to, you never know what kind of can you're going to open up when you ask somebody what's going on. The other day I got a, a um, an Instagram DM from an old friend of mine. We've kept in contact on Instagram, but we haven't talked in a long time. And one of the guys from our high school group that we spent time with all the time committed suicide. And we jumped on the phone and we talked and I have not heard my friend's voice in so long. I don't think I've talked to him or anybody from that group on the phone since 1996. So I got out of high school and I've said this before in some other podcasts, I started getting into some trouble. After getting in trouble twice, um, I spent some time in the local jail Nothing major, but I was in there for a couple days waiting to post bond or whatever. This crew, we used to call ourselves the NGK, the North Garland Kings. And all we were were good high school friends. Didn't really do anything wrong. We just kind of roamed around. We all bought these sweatshirts with our names on them, the NGK, and people thought we were a gang. But all we were is we were just friends. We played pickup basketball game together. We hung out. And you know, there's always the click within the click. Everybody listening, hopefully, can identify with a click within a click. So you have your group of seven friends, but in that seven friends, there might be one or two of you that hang out more often, and another one or two hang out more often, but you all hang out together, right? So the last time I saw them, they were standing there. I remember that they were, they were told by their parents that they couldn't hang out with me anymore. And I was so angry at the time. 
I was no longer part of that group that I had spent so much time with through all throughout high school. So this was after high school. And you realize as an adult many years later that you, if you're an adult and you have kids, children, and there's always that one kid is kind of getting in trouble and you don't want your kid hanging out with that kid because of the negative influence, you know, you have no idea what kind of situation they're going to find themselves in. You understand that as an adult. Now, I never did anything crazy, never did anything overly, you know, didn't do anything violent, never harmed anyone. But I got myself, I, I allowed myself to get caught up in some, you know, shitty situations and some bullshit. So I really didn't talk to these guys for the longest. You know, I may have ran into them somewhere, but I always found different crews. I, always, I was that guy who always had like four or five different crews. And so we got out of touch. And in the last... I don't know, the last few years with social media, I'm like, okay, well, one of the guys, Adam, reached out to me and he said he's been watching me on social media for a while. He follows the podcast and one auto and all that kind of stuff. We connected, sent text messages back and forth, you know, social media DMs back and forth. Another guy, Ryan, we did the same thing, reconnected with a guy, Philip, reconnected with my friend, Michael, who was my best friend in high school. And one guy I kept looking for, I'm like, hey, whatever happened, uh, you know, so-and-so, I'm not going to say his name out of respect for his immediate family, his sister and his mother, but it's, you know, whatever happened to so-and-so. And I would always try to look for him on, on social media and I couldn't, I could not locate him. Now, Adam and this guy, they hung out more. Like I said, they hung out till early 2003. So to have heard that news the other day, it was, it was really bad, obviously. But what happened with that is I ended up calling Adam called Ryan, called another friend of ours, TJ, from way back in the day. It was so good to hear their voices for the first time in 24, 25 years. And I was always that guy that was the one who always reached out to people that I hadn't seen or heard from in a long time. And I do that with a lot of my my crew that were after the NGK. So the, the guys that I ran with from, you know, 96 to 1999 when I moved out of, out of Texas, and you guys, the, the point of this whole thing is you have to try to keep in contact with the people that you were closest with years ago, because you never know what people are going through. You never know what people are going through right in front of you. But if you have those old friendships, those old connections, even if you don't do some sort of a reunion trip, reach out. If you're friends with them on, on social media, you know, reach out and uh, reestablish those contacts, reestablish those connections. And sometimes sending a DM just isn't good enough to, to hear their voice. And I'm talking about people you're legit friends with. Like me and these guys, we used to hang out all the time. I discovered the Acura NSX through these guys. So Ryan was the first one that was infatuated with the car. And once we all saw it, our entire group became infatuated with the car. And I'm the only one that actually ended up getting the car. But those things I remember. We would crash house parties, and no one wanted us around. We weren't scrubs, but we weren't the popular kids, you know? That's why we kind of had our own little thing going. Like, you think of every high school movie where there's a group of them, that they're kind of, they show up at the party, and no one really wants them there, and they just have each other. That was our group. That's all we did. So don't forget about those people. Don't forget about the people who helped mold you, who helped shape you through those high school years, if you have a good relationship with them, if you had a good relationship with them. I didn't have a bad relationship with any of these guys. But I just think about how many years I spent, you know, during that time thinking that they kicked me out of their group. They left me. I didn't leave them. That's fine. Moving on. It's funny what you think about as a teenager versus what you think about as an adult. Through age comes perspective. And I'm really happy I was able to reconnect with these guys, most of them over social media. But the one guy I could never find was the one guy who's no longer here. And it's just too bad that it took that event of him taking his own life. And he's been suffering with depression, from what I understand, for a long time. He wouldn't even leave the house, which explains why I couldn't find him on social media. Growing up, I didn't have a big family. I think I've said that before. It was my, myself, my adopted brother. I'm also adopted. My parents. Our closest relative was 1,200 miles away. So for me, a lot of people, they grew up with their cousins, their first cousins, their second cousins, all in the same general area. Some of the friendships that I've formed through my life, they became my family. It's one of those things where 
And every kid goes through this, I think. You don't even listen to your parents because your parents don't know anything. And you realize when you're older, your parents know a lot, if you're lucky enough to even have parents. But your friends, your friends are the ones who understand you, right? They get me. My friends get me. They understand me. And I always had the challenge where I was happy with people, people are happy with me, but I don't. I never really felt that everyone or anyone actually really understood me. But I felt good with people and I had fun with people. And through my high school years, these were the people. NGK forever. Check on those people who helped make you. Check on those people you had some of those greatest memories with. Don't lose touch with people. So everybody, guess who I caught up with? Blast from the past. Instrumental in the creation of the show was my ride or die. So he went off and did bigger and better things. And I got stuck sitting at home doing nothing (laughs) but trying to be creative. Brando, welcome back to the show, my man. What's going on, Zay? Thanks for having me back. Mikasa Sukasa, man. So where were you? Because all you do is travel. Last time we talked to you, I think you were getting ready to go to the Philippines or you were in the Philippines or God knows where. Where were you when the border shut down? So I, I I needed to go back to the Philippines for a project. So when I left here in February, I was dodging the closures. So I was in the Philippines and, uh, you know, was there for a little bit over a month and was going to go, was going to leave the Philippines, you know, stop by Hong Kong, go to Myanmar and go check out Thailand. But then my friends were like, you know, were like, they're going to close our borders in 48 hours. Shit. So, you know, I was there for about five weeks or so, and I'd gotten that notice. So I had to leave and come back. Of course, I'm coming back to the States. California is always a good option. You know, in, theory. Cal- in, th- in theory. In theory, you're right, in theory. You know, but with all of the stuff going on. And uh, I grew up in Florida, you know, like Panama City yeah. Beach. I mean, we're the Redneck Riviera, so kind of have that rebellious <laughs> you know so i was like I, i'm going back to florida we we ain't got no you know they let us do whatever we wanted to do here so i'm glad that you know i made that decision to come back to the, to the beach and uh corona changed our plans you know like i'm pretty sure corona changed some of your plans as well yeah when rona <laughs> hit we moved to a full-time remote and I worked for a one hospital system in Palm Springs. I was working there last time I talked to you. Then I got okay. let go in April. And I just started working three weeks ago. So I was just kind of collecting unemployment the whole time and, and running through this podcast and just kind of sitting back and watching the world and the United States <laughs> burn itself behind COVID and George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and all that kind of jazz. Oh, man, it's crazy. We rebelled. Everybody was bored and they, 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 they needed to uh, <laughs> complain and rebel about something, which is it good though. It seems like it. Which yeah. is good. I mean, it has its pros and cons and, you know, things needed to happen. Absolutely. So I was sitting back listening to an old episode. Several times we talked about the new Toyota Supra, which is not new anymore. It's just the Toyota Supra. Right. Some people call it the BMW Supra. <laughs> and we were talking about the C8, and the C8's been out for a few months now. They're slowly, I don't know if you've seen one on the road. I've seen a few. People are getting yep. a chance to drive them, and I thought it'd be awesome to reach out and get your ass on this podcast because we talked about it a couple episodes back then. I really haven't touched on it that much since then. A one year removed, where are you on the Supra? Where are you on the C8? I, I don't want any of them. Why not? <laughs> okay, so, so, okay, so, so just. That, you know, just thinking at it really quick, you know, like I would love for Cadillac to take on that C8 platform and do something with it, you know, create the Cadillac Halo car. And then the Supra is just, I don't know. I, I, I think I'm just, I maybe I haven't really understood why they went this route rather than, you know, like the curvature, the bigger, you know, I don't know. I'm having a hard time, you know, trying to connect the old Supra to this new Supra. Have you seen them side to side modified? Like how many of the new Supras have you seen? The A90s, I guess is what people are calling them. A a good amount of them, but I haven't seen them modified. Oh, so I've seen seen a few in stock trim. And it's just like I was saying last year, once you put a little lipstick on them, give them a body kit, 
wipe the sleepies out their eyes. Everybody's trying to sleep with them. And we have a few out here. They look, they look really good. And I remember saying that, that, you know, the car is still not for me. I've never driven one. I probably okay. could. I have a really good contact at the Toyota dealership, but it's just not a car for me. But it's, I think they look good out there on the road, modified, just like most other vehicles. Right. I think it definitely has its place. You know, with, I feel like the JDM sports cars are, are kind of getting momentum back again, you know? Sure. And, you know, it's just, it started with the, the Nissan, then the NSX, and then, you know, this, and then now they got the new, uh, they're going to release the new, new Fair Lady, the new Z, right? Hey, what are your thoughts on that? Did you see that? Yeah, man, I'm, I'm, it's, I'm not quite sure yet, but, uh, I'm, it, I, I think it'll be a good one for the car scene. It'll give us more options, you know, give us more cars, you know, to see in the parking lot, I guess. Yeah, so people were killing it, but I looked at an online poll on Apex Auto Motor Club, Apex, I don't know, on Facebook, and as much crap that it's getting, they said, what would you rather have, that or the Supra? And most people are picking the new Z, so take it with a grain of salt, right? Because it's the same deal they released to us the... Standard version, I think they picked a terrible color to release it, you know, in that canary yellow because you can't really see the intricate body lines. Yeah, right. But I think it's just like anything else. Just lower it a little bit. Somebody's going to throw a Liberty Walk kit on it and people are going to love it. <laughs> yep, yep. Stands, stands it, uh, uh, Liberty Walk, Rocket Bunny on it, you know, a cool wrap. Yeah. yeah, it's not a bad car. And what about the C8 now? You've seen... Reviews just as we had both okay. predicted, nobody was getting a C8 for $60,000 or $59,95. 59995 as they were advertising back then. I think the average price of acquisition is around 80 85 grand. Wow, would you spend that money on that car? No, because I'm not a big fan of it. Um, I think it's it's cool what they've done. Billy Johnson was on here a few episodes ago. And we were talking about cars and stuff. And I don't think at the time he had driven one, but I did reach out to him after he drove one. And he still said that his NSX, his old NSX, like we have, is still a better handling car. Obviously, the power is completely different conversations. But I watched him just do another one, another test drive with different tires, I think Sport Cup 2s. And it was like a night and day difference. But it's not enough for me. I understand that it is for some. I still maintain that no one's, who was realistic, realistically thinking about buying a Ferrari or buying a new NSX decided to change their mind and buy a C8. I think people right, kind of had their right. minds made up. Oh yeah, they're not, they're not, no one is stealing uh, uh, that you know that 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 new Corvette as cool as it is. It's not going to steal new people, you know. Yeah, it's, it's not, not disrupting gonna... the market. I think it's disrupting the manufacturers, putting people on notice. But I don't, I don't think it's disrupting the market. Yeah, I think I think that's that new Corvette was built for. The people that already were in that Corvette, you know, market already, you know, the the Camaros, Corvettes, like that market. Yeah. And I'm excited to see the Z06 unveiled. A a good friend of mine sent me a spy photo that his brother sent him from Colorado. So that'll be cool. It's probably going to have some different arrows, some different wheels. Obviously, it's going to have like, I don't know, like 650 horsepower or something stupid, but... Still the same car, still has some funny angles, but I, no, I, I don't have any inclination to get one. Would would you take one if someone gave it one to you? Probably, right? Take take it, yeah, of course you'll take it, I'll, I'll, but I don't have to keep it, right? Like, <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> I would totally I take one for a spin. It, right, yeah. right, spin it and get something else. I oh, talking about the uh, um, an upgraded version. I've I've seen some articles about the new NSX that is going to have like a Targa and then it's going to have a uh, a Type R. Did you see that? I haven't seen article? those articles. I've seen some rumors, but I haven't seen anything that I would consider legit or official. I did see one person come out with a Type R, which you and I both know that Accurate doesn't typically use that naming. Right. There was the Acura Integra Type R, and I think that's the last time they ever used it. So Acura uses Advanced. They use A-Spec, I think. Yeah, they have an A-Spec and then an S-Spec as well, I think. If, yeah, yeah, Type S, there you go. Yeah, Type S. If they're going to come out with a a better version of the current NSX, I can see it being called a Type S or something, but I can't see it being called a Type R just because they haven't done it. You're right, you're right. 
it wouldn't be. I, I, you're right, but unless it's a marketing gimmick, you know, of first time in the U.S. Type R. Yeah. So, which by the way, I was up on it in an NA1 Type R. They have one at Science of Speed. It was, I want to say, 1992 or 93. Wow. Um, it was pretty cool to see one. I don't know if I'd want one. It's just not enough car for me. As ridiculous as that sounds, Chris Wilson was quoted as saying that still the the Zanardi, which by the way, I don't know if you saw the Zanardi 51 went for $277,000 on bringing a trailer. Yeah, good job. But the Zanardi was a, a superior car to the NSX Type R, and I believe him. So people are like, what? It's an R. No way, man. But the Zanardi is a Type S Zero, essentially, or a Type S, which is a slightly more rare and better version of a Type R. So, whatever. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yep, that's what and it that, is. I, and would you, if you had that money, would you buy a Zanardi or would you buy a normal NSX and then play with it? You know? I feel like, like if I had enough money to buy a Zanardi, I wouldn't do like much with it. Piece, like exactly, a collector piece? Exactly. You know? Um, yeah, I would like love a trophy piece. I, exactly. I said a few episodes ago in a and a that I would love a Type S Zero. Yeah. It's the lightest... It is one of the lightest NSXs ever made. It's one of the rarest in number made. I mean, it's still 290 horsepower, but it is, it's the Zanardi without an air condition or without the creature comfort. So it's a little lighter, but it's, it's rare. So if I had the money, I would buy one of those. Oh, sounds like an car. investment piece though. You know, like I see people flipping classic cars, man. Yeah. I don't, I don't have they that kind of money. But the 25-year rule, though, right? So I believe that the Type S0 is an NA2. It is an NA2, which means it has to be a 97 to 99 car, which means next year is the 25th year. So by 2022, if someone had the money and one was available, they could spend the money on a Type S0 and import it. So that'd be interesting. And I wouldn't be that person. I don't, <laughs> I don't have that kind of money, but... <laughs> it's expensive car. So I have a question for you, and we're, actually, you have time to stick around for the Q and A segment. Sure. All right. When we come right back, we'll do the Q and A segment with Brando Barrameda. It's time for the Q and A segment, sponsored by Last Era Brand Motorsports Clothing, Vintage Racing Inspired to appear. What? I just completely fucked up. All right, let me start over. <laughs> I don't know. Everything just got blurry on me. <laughs> it's time for the Q&A segment sponsored by the last era brand motorsports clothing vintage racing inspired apparel to celebrate and represent the 80s and 90s era of motorsports racing from group B Le Mans IMSA Indy and Formula One follow them on Instagram at last era brand or go to shopping at last era brand.com tell them the hard parking podcast sent you so puzzled minds podcast asks will there be laws regarding sex robots and its place in society in the future do you have any thoughts on that yeah, actually, uh, I was in Asia and everything is pretty much robotic, you know, and uh, and people were talking about utilizing uh, sex dolls as uh, like toys, you know, so I don't think they should have any laws to see how you play with your toy. You know, I, I tend to agree because I, there's so many layers to this answer right or this or this question because remember that movie artificial intelligence and that's the first time anybody saw jude law and in that movie it was futuristic and he was i think he was a a, a sex worker right. but he looked like a human so there's that level you know where it would probably be re regulated at some point or illegal and then there's probably where you can go on and buy so i've seen this movie a long time ago called cherry 2000 and we may have actually talked about it, but it's, I want to say it's not Meg Ryan, but Molly Ringwald. And in the movie, the, the main character guy, it's like in the Mad Max type of thing where it's in the future. Okay. He has this maid that's his girlfriend and they start making out and she gets wet from the soap and she short circuits and ends up being an android. And so she looks like a person. So he goes on this trip, hires Molly's character to take him out to this far because obviously there's one left in some factory in the middle of fucking hell zone, right? <laughs> so they go out there and they retrieve the doll. And I think at the end of the day, he ends up leaving the doll, spoiler alert, and staying with Molly. So, you know, I think if it's on if it's on a, a, a consumer level, then like you said, you, there shouldn't be a lot of play with your toys. 
But if it's on right. a more organized level, like on iRobot, where things are owned by some corporation, then who knows? But I've seen some of those dolls, man. The Japanese are making some crazy shit. Right. I, I just remember, I, I don't remember, but I watched a movie recently to where they had like sex robots. I would say it was like an episode of Westworld or something like that. Sounds possible. So, yeah. East Def's ask, is the Nicola legit? And oh, this is the, the truck. This this has been all in the news. And when he first asked the question, I was like, what the fuck is Nikola? Are you taking saying like Nikola Tesla? Because I've just been completely absent-minded at the time. But I did some research on it. Like, what are your thoughts on that? Because I remember hearing about this truck company a couple of years ago. Oh, well, actually, <laughs> when you first said Nikola, Nikola, I was thinking you're talking about, yeah, about Jokic, man. I was like, I don't the know. The Joker? That. Yeah, I was the like basketball three, player. Uh, no, man, we ain't one. talking basketball. I was like three one. They're down. The <laughs> Side note, though, they've been down three one twice so far, and they've come back both times. I don't know right. if they do it this time, right. but they've done it both times. So, right. but no, Crazy. we're talking about Nicola, which has been in the news because they made all these promises. They have this cool truck. It's the next electric vehicle, and blah blah blah. Their main chairman and founder stepped down, and he just ghosted. Oh, wow. So I admittedly didn't know that much, but I recently looked into it. So if you don't know anything about it, that's fine, because I didn't know shit 48 hours ago. Yeah, good. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested. Yeah, <laughs> what happened there? It looks like they all the, they made a bunch of empty promises, and there's a thing out there where they filmed the, the, the pickup truck kind of going downhill. And when I started researching it a little bit, because I don't know for sure. I'm throwing this disclaimer out to people listening who may know for sure. I don't know for sure. Brando obviously doesn't have any idea either. But the rumor is that truck never actually worked. And they towed it to the top of the hill and they filmed it rolling <laughs> rolling down. And Ooh, about their, their cutting edge technology, one thing that I read is that all they really did was took bits and pieces of everybody else's technology and tried to pass it off as their own. So... Without us knowing much about it, it sounds like they're in a lot of trouble. Based on what the, the little research that I did. Yeah, uh, I don't know, because you remember uh, Tesla's gave out, uh, what was it, their um, their plans so people can utilize uh, and build electronic vehicles, right? Yeah, I don't I know if this it was, was part of that. Yeah, I think I think there was then that you know, like you know, uh, um, small companies that you know, like wow, we 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 can make it work, and then you know, they're they're the uh, uh, paper entrepreneurs, you know, they can scribble things down, but like yeah, I think we can pull this off. And I think they bit more than what they could chew. I think that might be what's happening right here. They're comparing him, and him is Trevor Milton, to an Elizabeth Holmes who was a younger lady who was a college dropout. She gained a lot of famous success as the CEO and founder of this, I want to say pharmaceutical company. Oh, I and remember that one. They're defunct. They're belly up yep. because I guess people called her out or something. It collapsed. And so people, yep. it's called Theranos, the Theranos scandal. And it could be Theranos. I don't know. Yep. It's like a fire music festival. <laughs> That's an excellent, actually, analogy. You know, so I think we're both going to write that prepay. one off. <laughs> right. So the next question is from Wes Tankersley. Okay. And this goes directly into what we were talking about earlier. So if you had to choose, and I already know you said neither, but if you had to choose between the new Super or the C8 Corvette, which would you pick? The Supra. If I had to Why choose. would you pick the Supra? Because like <laughs> like you discussed earlier, tuned up, kitted right, cool. You know, looking at it as a Supra, you know, like a new Supra, not not trying to compare it to the old one. The new Corvette, I just don't like. I don't like the lines on it. You know, the vent on the side looks a little off to me. Like, and uh, I'm 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 hoping Cadillac takes that and make a Halo car, that platform, and make a Halo car. You said the same shit a year ago, which is funny about yeah. the, the Cadillac. <laughs> You were, that's what you were hoping for. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to pick the Supra too. Um, 
I would love to drive a C8 Corvette just to see what it's about. I still am more in love with the C7. I think the C7 yeah. is still an incredibly good looking car. Gorgeous. Uh, but I would take the Supra only because it fits in more to the scene. And when you doll it up a little bit, it seems more of a natural progression. I mean, when you right. see a modified Supra visually modified next to a modified MK4, they look more similar because the MK4 is bulbous and round, not as much as the, the A90 new one, but it's a lot more round than the MK3. So I would also right. pick the Supra. Yeah. Possum Killer MK6 asks, Rick and Morty or Archer? Oh, man, I don't watch both. I don't watch either. Um, so I'm going to say neither cause I don't watch either. I mean, I watched Archer. It seemed like it was okay. My wife didn't really like it. She wasn't into it. So we just moved on and I've never watched Rick and Morty. It looks a little weird. In fact, I think my nephew watches that. So yeah, my nephew watches that too. Not for me. So slammed fuck us says, and this is the one where, okay. So he says thoughts on car clubs in Arizona and why they would why you would or wouldn't be in one, but I'm going to go ahead and expand that thoughts on car clubs, period, why you would or wouldn't be in one. And I've been in two car clubs in my life. Yeah. I've been in two car clubs in my life, been invited to at least a dozen. Do you have any thoughts about car clubs? Cause you're not in one. I don't think you've been in one. Yeah. I think, yeah, we have different views on that. I think I would, it depends though. It depends. You know, I think there should, there should be a, an end goal for a car club. It can't just be hanging out and meeting up. Like there should be something productive that's being done, you know, like there should be some positive growth in there somewhere. So I don't know what car clubs really do. So I'm, I'm actually looking forward to, uh, to your thoughts or the pros and cons of it. But for me, for me to join a car club, somebody says, Hey, we're, doing this car club would you like to join like i'd like to see what their 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 what agenda about, is right? like yeah what their agenda is like what they're about what their voice is like what have they done in the past are they giving back to the community you know mm -hmm. like what the fuck mm -hmm. are we hanging out for like there, there should be more than just parking lot meetups and tgi fridays drinks you know like yeah i agree and um i think the the structure and the ideologies behind a traditional car club are, are changing with the times. I know when I was younger, I was not in a car club, but I had friends and I rode around with them in their car clubs. And then we're talking the nineties. And so oh, this yeah. was yep. back when you would get a car club plaque, like a, like this big metal plaque that looks like it was gold. And you put in your rear window, you have meetups. Nobody was in like, I don't know if car events just weren't the same, but they would say, okay, well, this, you know, are you going to go to the park this Friday night and post up? We're going as a car club and you would pay your dues. And I wasn't sure at the time what the dues were for. Fast forward to when I first moved out here, I joined a local car club as a means of getting acclimated in networking and meeting people in the community. No better way, in my opinion, if you're moving to a new area and you want to learn about the cars in the area, you might as well just hook up with a car club for a little while. But we had dues. I was like, well, what is this money? I'm a grown man. What am I paying money for? Well, we're paying for cleaners. And so I said, I have my own cleaners. What am I paying money for? Well, we're paying money for tents and stuff. I said, that's a one-time purchase. You already have your tents. What am I paying my money for? You know? So eventually I left the car club. And they were, it's a cool group. But I think some people want that structure. Some people like to just be a part of something to feel they're a part of something, but kind of what you were saying, you know, what is a car club doing? You know, what are they doing in the community? Sometimes they have game night, they hang out together, which is cool. Right. You know, it's, it's camaraderie. And so there's nothing wrong with being in a car club. A lot of my friends are in car clubs and a lot of the car clubs are different. They have different philosophies. Um, so that's kind of the advantage, I guess, of why you would want to be in it. You want to kind of belong to a car group. Sometimes you don't know where to go. So you need somebody to say, Hey, Three months from now, there's a major car event. We're all going as a group. We're going to park together. We're going to represent. We're going to win a prize as the most team representation. We're going to have a team cookout, stuff like that. Um, yeah. See, I, I'm part of a, a car Facebook group. Like, you know? Not the same. <laughs> okay. <laughs> not the same. But but here's the thing. That group, they can say, if, you've got, if there's several of you in the same area, hey, man, let's all go on a cruise. 
Right. So you're not technically part of a car club, but you're in the group and you're doing a group cruise. Like we have the AZ and a sex owners forum and it's the same deal. Right. Yeah. So I think yep. that's a big difference now between like when you and I were kids. Right. right. So like, what are the thoughts? Why, why wouldn't you be in one? Because you want to be independent because some car clubs out there, including the one that I used to be part of, they would say, you have to be at this show. If you don't come to this show, if you don't show up at this time, then you can find another car club. You have to wear your car club t-shirt or, or group shirt, which sometimes can be very hot and ugly. You got to <laughs> hang out with us. It's like, I like to go to a car event park and hang out with who my friends who I, I don't want to have to be told who I can and can't hang out with and stuff like that. So that's why you, a lot of people choose not to be part of a car club because some car clubs are ran by people who have demands. And if you're an adult, yeah, if you're an adult, you don't want to deal with that shit because sometimes you have to work on a Saturday and you can't go to the car show. Sometimes you travel all the time and your only time at home is Friday, Saturday, and you're flying out Sunday. You don't want to have to be told what to do. So that's why, and, and you've never been in a club and you're doing just fine yourself. So, so Will LS 430 asks, is it really necessary to wear driving gloves to a cars and coffee? Is he trolling us? Probably. <laughs> but there's some people who still wear it. He's probably doing a little trolling, but there's people who, I mean, I haven't seen it. I know that, like, what are your thoughts on that? Like, I haven't personally seen it, but I can, if, I can if picture I a scenario. Up, if I pulled up in the 1958 Bentley that happens to be slammed, I would wear my, glo- my driving gloves. You know, as funny as that is, there's there's some real hardcore truth to that because I did a little yeah. research and there's a reason why it's called the glove compartment, right? Yep. Because back in the day, before cars had hard tops, the steering wheel, which wasn't covered in supple leather, would get very hot. And so people would wear gloves for comfort when driving their vehicles. And oh. there's times in the winter when I lived in Michigan where it would be so fucking cold in the car when you're first driving it and that steering wheel would be frozen and you have your winter gloves on so they're not technically driving gloves but it's still the same thing and there's some cars that come with driving gloves when my yes. friend bought a Lamborghini I want to say yep, it was a Lambo, Gallardo Lambo or Lambo Gallardo Lambo or some shit yeah they come with these beautiful white gliding, <clears throat> driving gloves that are stored in the frunk if it has a frunk or the trunk if it has a trunk or the glove compartment so um, is it necessary probably not but to your point, if you're pulling up in something clean, classic, old school, yep. I expect for you to be wearing driving gloves. If you pull up in an old ass Porsche, <laughs> yeah, it goes with it. You know. Last question, Catherine Cox, who's a contributor to the show, big fan of the show, and this is an interesting question. So basically, it's given the landscape of 2020, right? So what we've learned in 2020 is that people are being forced to work from home. And I think that that's going to carry over even when all this is over, because once people have learned to be productive at home, you know, you have a brick and mortar that's costly. It just seems like it costs more to bring people into the office. So the money that people would typically have to spend on their daily commuter cars, are they going to spend it more on their show cars, their own personal vehicles? Is the level of modification at car shows and crap like that going to improve? You know, are people going to spend the extra money on their cars, I guess, is the question here. I think 2020 made us realize and understand ourselves, gave us time to take a break from our work and get sent home to our bed in our house, you know, for for a few, for a month until we figured things out. And I think a lot of us learned ourselves, you know, some people probably value their car. If that's the case, because their car gets them in, uh, gets them involved in the community, then maybe they will spend more money there. But th- the person that experienced, the, you know, to where they were dumping a lot of money in the car scene and then they lost their job and it affected them in a bad way, maybe they wouldn't look at it that way anymore. You know, maybe they want to check themselves out from the materialistic things and spend it more on, luxuries like you know trips we we didn't realize that was a luxury before that we can just before it got taken away yeah before it got taken away we didn't we didn't look at traveling as luxury me and you we traveled a lot for work did we look at it as luxury you and i always complained you and i always complained like oh shit gotta work yeah gotta do this leaving out you know sleeping in the hotel for weeks at a time but looking back now holy shit you know like that was a luxury 
So I think it just yeah. depends on the person and depends on how they they got to understand themselves through 2020. Yeah, I'm going to agree. One thing I tell people is that I miss expense reports. I miss discounts on stakes. I miss rental cars. I, I agree. I don't think people are going to, whatever money they're saving and commuting, they're going to probably put towards other bills and other leisure. I don't think people are going to say, okay, well, I don't have to spend this much money on my car anymore. Or say, okay, now I have this extra money. I'm going to spend more on my car. Because one thing that 2020 has showed us and maybe this year is a bad example, but it's the only example that we have. As you were saying, everything got turned upside down and you, you learn a lot about yourself. So mm-hmm. let's say I spent a whole lot of money on my car before. Now it's like, well, that got taken away. And now if I'm example B from earlier, now it's okay. like, why did I even spend that money on that shit? That's, that's insignificant. And if I'm example A, well, maybe they would start to spend more money on mods, but maybe they would spend it somewhere that they realized was more beneficial because this year put us on notice. Oh yeah, man. To change. Like it puts <laughs> you, it asks you like, where's your priority? Fortunately for me, I'm, I'm, I'm light footed in a way to where, you know, I'm not married. I don't have any kids. You know, I don't have any baby moments or anything like that. I'm able to just disappear and come and go and change and, you know, or hit a reset if I need to, you know, for sure. Yep. Well, that concludes our Q&A segment. Brando, I want to thank you so much for taking the time. Yes, sir. Thank you. I appreciate it. Before we get to our next segment, I want to talk about a couple cars that are coming out that I'm pretty excited about. So Jeep has announced that they're going to do the Wagoneer. They announced this a few weeks ago. So the Wagoneer, when I think of a Jeep Wagoneer, I think of this old school SUV looking thing before the word SUV even existed with the big like wood panels. The wood paneling, not really my style, but this new Wagoneer. So apparently they want to get back into the game. They want to compete with like the Escalade, Ford Expedition, and the Tahoe. And this thing, so you guys look it up, the 2021 Jeep Wagoneer. And they're also going to have one called the Grand Wagoneer, which, so the Jeep Wagoneer, I think is supposed to start around $60,000. The Grand Wagoneer is supposed to be like a hundred grand or more. But when you look up the Jeep Wagoneer, the Grand Wagoneer, this thing looks dope. I love the interior. I love the exterior. I love the big ass wheels. They're finally going to give us some decent fuel efficiency, I guess. Because that's one thing that Jeep has, in my opinion, dropped the ball on over the last few years. And that's the excuse I always give myself for not going out and getting a Grand Cherokee, although I love Grand Cherokees, is the fuel mileage absolutely sucks. That and I can't buy a new car right now because I'm holding out for a different vehicle. But if you look at the interiors of this thing, the infotainment, the connectivity, everything about this Jeep is absolutely stunning. Then there's the 2021 Acura RDX PMC edition. This thing is thermal orange, dark interior, orange stitching. This thing looks phenomenal. I can't really imagine myself driving around in an orange SUV or mini SUV or whatever we're calling this thing. But if I was going to, it would have to be something like a Lamborghini or this Acura, because this Acura looks fast. I don't know if you guys, if, maybe you just haven't paid attention, but those RDXs, nice looking vehicles. Like they might be the sharpest SUV in their class. Well, definitely in their class, but they could be one of the sharpest looking SUVs on the road, but they're a little small. I'd put this up against like a Range Rover Evoque, because these are a little bigger than the Range Rover Evokes, but not much. I feel like with an SUV, it's got to be roomy. So for mine, you guys know I use it for everything. I use it for Home Depot. I use it for, well, everything. And the poor thing has to sit outside because there's not room in the garage for multiple vehicles. Although we have multiple vehicles. So whatever I get, if it's not another nice car, which goes in the garage, then the SUV is going to have to suffer outside. And I just don't know how useful the RDX PMC edition or the RDX period, even if it's the type S that's rumored to come out. I don't know how useful that's going to be for me. God, I could, I I just wish Acura, will you just give me one for a week or two? Just let me drive it around, please. Pretty please. Anyway, coming up builders corner segment. Time for the Builders Corner segment sponsored by DressUpBolts.com. Follow them at DressUpBolts on Instagram and visit them at DressUpBolts.com. They have titanium bolts that not only vastly improve the look of your vehicle, but serve a purpose as well. Available to dress up the engine engine bay. 
have kits ready to go for your specific application. And right now, check out their new Arrow Catch hood pin kits available in several different colors made from GR5 titanium so you will never have to worry about corrosion ruining the look of your hood. Go and pay them a visit and use code HARDPARKING, one word, and save 10% today. Today, our Builder's Corner segment guest is actually really a special guest, Brian Keenow. Some of you don't know that name by that name, but NSX owners will know him as Brian K. Brian, thank you for taking the time. Thanks, Jalen. Good talking to you. Yeah, it's been a long time. So one of the first things that I noticed when I bought my car eight years ago is that my air conditioner would either blow on high or wouldn't blow at all. It's one of those things you, you, you get online, you ask people, does anybody know? And everyone's like, Brian K, Brian K, Brian K. That's you. So can you kind of tell us what that is? What causes that? Main problem with the units are the capacitors, the electrolytic capacitors. Uh, they actually have some, uh, they have actually have a liquid in them. Some of that leaks out and uh, damages the circuit board. And when you lose connections on your circuit board, things stop working. So why does that affect that radio or does it affect a lot of radios or just like a Japanese radio type of thing? Do you, do you know the answer? Uh, well, I mean, a lot of people don't remember the, the big Dell fiasco with all the Dell computers that had all bad capacitors. So it's all in that vintage where there was a large amount of capacitors that were just really poor quality that were put out in the market and heat and time, um, they go bad. And so we got lucky. <laughs> and inherit those in our cars that are already rare as it is. Parts on cars, even a high-end car, uh, they're all built down to a cost. So yeah, if they can save a tenth of a cent a capacitor, um, the people in manufacture, I mean, Acura Honda doesn't build those parts. They, it was just one it, of those things. I think I think it's happened on, I mean, there was other issues with other parts for other cars, but and so for our cars, we're talking the 1991 to 2005 Acura NSX. And again, this is the, the famous Brian K for us NSX owners on the phone. For us, what are the classic signs or is the only sign basically what I had where it either blows on high or doesn't blow at all? Fan only running on high is the most common issue that uh, that people notice. Uh, also, secondary um, the units will go completely dark. People will have complaints of... Uh, uh, damper motors clicking or they got heat coming in the cabin all the time. So they've lost control of the, of the damper motors that control uh, the heating and the, where the air goes and, and the recirculation damper and stuff. So um, those are less apparent, but people will notice that at some point. So there's several different uh, fan only running at high. That seems to be the one that comes to light probably 90% of the time. Sure. And is it safe to assume, we don't know, really want to assume anything, but is it safe to assume that in an older vehicle, that's your your biggest sign that possibly that it's the same issue that we have in our vehicles? Uh, possibly, but the NSX is is a pretty special climate control unit. Most cars mm, okay. just, have a, just have a resistor with four speeds. So um, obviously, NSX is a little more uh, sophisticated with the very, you know, a power transistor and a variable speed motor. The NSX is pretty uh, kind of almost a one of a kind design. But that's not all you do, though, is it? You, we work on some other stuff with the NSX that uh, I didn't know about before talking to you. What are some of the other things you you can repair? Um, obviously, climate control units, speaker amplifiers. Been doing uh, a few of the. There's not many of them around, but the power amplifiers for the electronic power steering have issues that I've been able to fix some of those. Don't see a lot of those because there aren't a lot of power steering cars. The supplemental restraint system on the early cars, the SRS units, those are failing now. Same capacitor leakage issues. So, And then, of course, uh, the famous gauge instrument cluster problems that we're starting to see on cars and hearing about cars uh, you know, catching on fire from instrument cluster fires. So, Sweet. Leaky, leaky capacitors again, so I'm mm. starting to do more and more of those. So hopefully, I get them before they have any burnt, any you know, they start on fire, and and I obviously do a complete replacement of all the failure, failure prone electrolytic capacitors. Well, that and that's what I do with any of the repairs. Once I once I go in there, it's everything gets replaced with high quality replacements. So once I fix the stuff, fix things, uh, I don't see them again. <laughs> sure. <laughs> And I've been doing it for 15 years. 
So I don't know if this is one of those signs, but I realized or I noticed very, very recently that my trip odometer wasn't running all the time. Like I filled up with some gas and I drove and I looked and I was like stuck between all zeros and like 0.3. And I was like, that's not right. So I reset it and it's worked since then. But it seems like it's, I don't know if that's just gunk in the system or what, what's going on there. I don't know if you, if you have an answer to that, but. Yeah, that's a good question. I really haven't delved into that. I mean, the triple odometer does get a signal from, uh, from the electronics. Um, I do have a, I do have a cluster coming in. That's got that issue with it that I'm going to have to look at and actually delve in, but I don't have a lot to say about that right now. <laughs> well, I don't let me I know. know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> don't know if it's an, like I said, I'm not sure if it's an electronic problem or just a, a mechanical problem with the triple odometer just wearing out. With. I'm definitely going to follow up with you on that one then for sure. So if people want to get a hold of you, Brian, how do they reach out to you? Do they just find you on Instagram? Do you have a, a dedicated page on Instagram? Um, best way is through my email. So that would be Brian K surprisingly at, uh, <laughs> at NSX E dash repair.com. And that's obviously the name of my website also. All right, Brian key. Now I want to thank you. Everybody knows you as Brian K. I want to thank you for coming on the show and uh, sharing some valuable information. All right. Appreciate it. Good talking to you. And I am, you know, if anybody needs any help, obviously I'm, more than happy. Hit me up on my email, Ryan K at nsxerepair.com, and uh, I'll get back to you and we'll get something set up. Thanks, Brian. All right. Have a good one. Thanks. Okay. I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to make this happen, but on the line, I have Johnny Valencia just got done spearheading the lead car for Gold Rush Rally. Johnny, thanks for getting on the call. So you are in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Yeah, yeah, sitting here trying to relax uh, for a second day after the end of a quite a epic journey that we put on. Yeah, so your gold rush this year, um, I don't remember what the original dates were, but it looks like you guys took off on the Friday the 18th. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. And we had to push the event from our original mid-June uh, dates uh, because of the obvious COVID uh, situation. and. We were able to uh, secure some dates in September, secure the hotels, and start planning. So this thing officially ended. So today is Monday, the 28th of September. So this thing officially ended on the 26th a couple days ago. Yeah, a couple days ago here in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. It feels like it was six months ago (laughs) from when we started because everything is just such a blur. But um, man, man, oh man, what an adventure that we went on. How many of these rallies have you been on? Yeah, for me, this is the third. I did Gold Rush 10, which was uh, Boston to Vegas. And then I did Gold Rush last year um, as well. So the first one I did, uh, I I did as a participant or as a sponsor or whatever when I was with Michelin. Yeah, that's when you guys came through here, through Arizona. I was remember. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah. And then last year was my first time as uh, management staff of Gold Rush Rally and then the same thing this year as well. So for the listeners, because some people listening to this know exactly what Gold Rush Rally is. Some have absolutely no idea. Paint the picture for the listeners what we're looking at with Gold Rush Rally, more specifically on the cars type of deal. Absolutely. So over the past 12 years, uh, Gold Rush Rally started 12 years ago. Um, They wanted to basically put together a driving adventure, a driving rally, a driving experience for those who actually enjoy driving their supercar, exotic cars, and hypercars. Um, that community has really grown over the last decade. You have Ferraris, Lambos, McLarens, even higher cars like Bugattis and whatnot that like to look at them while they sit in their garage, maybe take them out to a local car show every now and then. And then you have the people who like Gold Rush Rally who will take those exact cars and drive them 3,000 miles across the country because they love to drive. They love the sense of automotive community and they they love the sense of the adventure into not quite the unknown, but into uh, unique situations that maybe they don't aren't able to do on their own. It's one time a year. Uh, the, the team, the management team and the staff works about 10 months out of the year to plan the event. And uh, every year is different. It's a different starting point, different ending point, and then 
it's either eight, nine, 10 days is what it's been usually. So this year, obviously being 2020 and when we, when we talked last, that was at the end of March and we were talking about car shows and how events would pan out. And I don't think either one of us really expected them to, because basically everything has been postponed, even SEMA, except for you guys are able to pull this off. And I understand why, because you're out in the open road, you're practicing social distancing type of deal, you know, and not everybody's congregated except for when you're leaving the parking lot and coming in from a fan reception, because I don't know how I can get the listeners to understand just how big of an ordeal is it's so you take your biggest musical act they get into town Mm -hmm. and it's a huge deal there's tons of people just waiting for them and i think this is the premier event for car rallies in america to where everywhere you guys go where you start where you finish there can be as many as several thousand people there to receive you guys how has this year been different because i did see when you guys were at the the thai restaurant it looked like several hundred people but just with you being on your third event, how visually different has it been this year? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, it was definitely a challenge. Uh, everything that you said is true. And what, what was interesting that we were able to adapt to, um, with this being such a unique and different year is, uh, once we understood that there were limitations, uh, regarding things like groups and gatherings, uh, we really had to adjust our routes. So by being on the road longer, that means that we had less time to, you know, have to figure out what to do as far as activities or, um, you know, mingling at the resorts and hotels. So we adjusted the routes to just allow people to drive through some of the most amazing roads that America has to offer. So yes, they were long days, but um, ultimately it was a much greater reward than, you know, stopping into a city and going to a nightclub or doing something like that, which we can't do anyways. And as far as the fans, um, we typically create fan events into every event or every city that we arrive to. And because of limitations of gatherings, we did not publicly offer any fan events. Yes, there were still some that showed up on their own because they knew that we would eventually arrive into that city. But yes, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho was a little different. We arrived to our dinner spot and uh, Coeur d'Alene at the moment is a zero covid restriction uh town yeah so um yeah they (laughs) they showed up and we're like we're like oh we're like what do we do is this okay because you know everything's kind of weird right now but um no it was awesome to see that those fans in that city come out and welcome us it is different the other part that was different this year for us is that we had probably I might say 50% new, particip- new participants. That was a question um, I was going to ask about, uh, you know, how often do people come back? Because we know that there's a lot and then versus new. So you answered that ahead of time. Yeah. 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 So, you know, a lot of our past participants that have been coming for years and years and years are actually from outside of the country. So because of travel mm, restrictions, they yeah. were they were unable to come in. And then we feel from speaking to these new participants, you know, these are, these are people that just people just want to get out, you know, they wanted to do something. So we were able to recruit uh, a lot of new folks that brought some amazing cars, did some amazing driving. We made some amazing connections with them. uh, And we're looking forward to having now them come back next year as well. I think one of the biggest misconceptions about the gold rush rally, there's a couple, but I think one of the biggest ones is that it's 150 cars and they're all 250,000 and up several multi-million dollar vehicles, but it, there's been Mustangs and there's been, I mean, hell, Ted seven drives the little, uh, the Fiat. The Fiat. So yeah. It seems like anybody who wants to pay and probably go with the charity, which is another thing. If you want to flip the bill, you can go. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we had, um, Goldie, the old, uh, C10 pickup truck, um, come on the rally this year from Provost Motorsports, uh, Ted's, Fiat. Uh, We had a pretty badass CTSV wagon uh, that joined us this year as well. Uh, New team. So um, a lot of cool cars. Uh, And and then on the other side of the spectrum, Savage Garage brought an SVJ, uh, a Pagani Huayra, a Koenigsegg CCX. And then in Vegas, they had their, it's the number one delivered RS6 um, Avant in the US. It got delivered into Vegas and they did a second half with us as well. So Really, really awesome cars this year um, to be able to, to to have some fun with on the road. 
Another misconception is a lot of these participants are participating on half of charities. It's not just a bunch of super wealthy people just partying and having fun because they are partying and having fun. But a lot of these cars, right, seem to go towards some very well-known charities. Yeah, absolutely. So this year, um, once again, the Taylor Lynn Foundation was our, our rally charity. And what was a, what was great to see is a local artist uh, from from the area here produced this handmade carved wood and painted and stained and uh, piece of art of the American flag. And during our award ceremony a few nights ago, uh, we auctioned it off and um, actually raised $10,000 to be able to go towards Taylor Lynn Foundation. And then we also have the Elephant Corporation, uh, which also is to raise money to save the elephants uh, that are starting to dwindle away in Africa as well. So um, lots of lots of good, uh, you know, outside of just community also with the charities. So I'll get you out of here on this. So on the last episode, I did an entire opening was about slower traffic keep right. And I used you guys mm-hmm. as an example of sometimes some of these rallies, you end up having to hire local law enforcement to give you an escort because what happens is, and you know this, is when you see, when people see a group of cars that are obviously traveling together, there's something in some people's heads where they just want to disrupt. They just like, well, I should be on this road too. Let me just go ahead and jump right in the middle of them or cut them off. And, you know, did you guys, Mm -hmm. how much of that do you experience? Or typically on these type of rallies, just like when you do the fuel run, people kind of understand that you guys are together and aren't trying to be that person because a lot of people do get out of the way but there's always those few people who are like this is my road too yeah yeah you know this year it really wasn't too bad and and i'm I'm gonna say it's because we had such early departures from the hotels going back to the fact that we had longer drives incorporated Mm -hmm. um we were departing hotels uh like at 7 7 30 a.m roads are clear Um, and the roads are cleaner. The roads are clear. And and then by the time we all as a group get on the road, then usually within half an hour, you start groups start breaking off. You know, you're instead of 60 cars. Now you have 12 cars here, 17 cars there, uh, nine cars there of people that kind of group off on their own to to comfortably drive with each other. So didn't really see too much of that, which is good. Um, you know, we want to exit the cities clean without disruption we don't want to create any additional traffic uh for the locals and the police escorts help tremendously with that you know being able to block off intersections and actually take us out of the the city into more open road uh um, away from traffic is a huge benefit and we thank all of them um for helping us with that i gotta say though you when i was watching you guys in Coeur d'Alene and there's always that guy. There's always a few of these people. And, and when this happens, you're always like, where's the cops? And sure enough, some guy goes by in his Charger or Challenger <laughs> and just rips ass when, when you're, you're on live on Facebook and the cops are right there and run his ass down. That was awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Some of the uh, locals try to uh, come by in their their vehicles and you know rev at us and stop and take off. And luckily, um, the guys in blue uh, were sitting there waiting to just take care of some of those folks trying to you know, be a little unlawful on the road, but it it was pretty funny. Um, But hopefully they, they they learned pretty quick (laughs) to kind of not do that again. Yeah. That's hilarious. Thanks John for taking the time. I know this was, it's amazing that you guys were able to pull this off one day, someday for sure. And enjoy the rest of your time in Jackson hole. Yeah. 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 And I just want to remind everyone, if you want to see any recap of what we just did over the last two weeks, Uh, The Gold Rush Rally uh, Facebook and Instagram pages are going to be posting mad content from the captures that we had from our videography team and photographers. Uh, And I'll be sharing all of that on my channels as well. So go take a look, follow, and uh, hopefully you enjoy it. I'll take care of you in the episode description. I'll make sure I put all those links. Awesome. Thanks. See ya. Always good to catch up with Johnny Valencia of Gear One Agency. He's doing stuff now with Gold Rush Rally. You can catch him on his personal at Southern German Nation. If you guys don't remember, earlier this year, I had him on and we talked about corporate sponsorships. So if you're interested in corporate sponsorships, go ahead and go back and listen to that episode. I want to say it's the one that posted April 2nd. It'll say something like Johnny Valencia, Michelin corporate sponsorships. Because getting a sponsorship for whatever it is you're into, the requirements, the things that they 
that a company is going to expect isn't going to be that much different regardless of what you're you're pursuing. So if you're a chef and you want a chef sponsorship somewhere with a restaurant, you're still going to have to have a proposal. Coming up on the next episode, hopefully we'll have Noel G. I teased it a little bit on social media. I was able to meet him. We talked super briefly at an event, and so hopefully I can get him on. He committed to it, but he's probably very busy. Still waiting on Fielding Shredder to send back my trophy. Fielding, I'm watching you. I'm stalking you on social media, but now I'll get it when I get it. He's an incredible guy, so if you haven't heard that episode, make sure you go back and listen to it a couple episodes ago, the full interview with Fielding Shredder. Guys, we're entering the last quarter of 2020. And it's been a really, really, really tough year, like I said at the beginning of this podcast. So make sure that uh, you reach out to your people. And before you know it, 2020 will be all over with and it'll be 2021. My friend Zach Johnson, I've said this before. I've given him props for his podcast. It's a great podcast, but I always call it the Limitless Podcast. And it's actually the Limitless Possibilities Podcast. So Zach, I apologize. I keep screwing that up. I promise you, I will get better. I want to thank Brando Barrameta for coming on. You can follow him at that damn Islander on Instagram. All one word, squished together. Brian Key now, which is Brian K for most of us. You can reach him at nsxerepair.com. So that's nsxe-repair.com. I want to thank the sponsors. Higher Quality Detail, Last Air Brand, Kuya Automotive, DressUpBolts.com, and of course, last but not least, NSX Channel. If you want to reach me, you can reach me at hardparkingpodcast at gmail.com. You can follow me on Instagram at na2nsx. J underscore travels. That's J H A underscore travels. Facebook.com, hard parking media. The YouTube page. I promise I will start getting more content back up. I apologize. I know people have been calling me out on that a little bit on the side. I apologize. Link is in the description for the Teespring page. Get your t shirt, get your podcast mug. If you want, you can support the show. You should support the show. 99 cents a month. By the math, on an average month, that's less than three cents a day. The man was eat three cents times 30, three times 30 is 33. It's less than three cents a day. Yeah, so I can't grow unless you tell people how great this show is. Share it with a friend. I would appreciate it. Let's do this. Let's grow this thing together.